Hello and welcome to today's ASIP webinar titled Surviving the COVID-19 Epidemic, Protecting Family and Employees and Managing Financial Issues and Burnout. At this point, I'd now like to pass the floor over to our first speaker, Dr. Lakshmaya Manchikanti. Dr. Manchikanti, if you're ready, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Trevor. Good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are from. So this is our second conference uh, during these horrible times on surviving the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, today, we are going to focus on protecting family and employees and managing financial issues and burnout. We will talk about multiple issues, first an overview, then managing stress and burnout, update on financial support, I'm sure everybody is wondering how to fill out these applications and how to get some money to keep the practice running. Then we are also going to talk about protecting family, friends, and employees during COVID-19. In future forums, we are going to talk about how we are going to reopen the practices, what type of infection control we need, and what changes we need to make. So everything is going to change now. As uh, Governor Cuomo said, we are never going to go to return to the normal. I'm not so sure about completely agree with him or not, but to some extent he may be accurate. First of all, it is so hard to remember not to cough into your hands. From there comes shake hands. So see, all the world leaders are changing. Everybody has gone to namaste from shake hands. So we have to change that too. The other things, of course, we hear this every day. We are not going to detail, go in detail, social distancing. I was washing my hands only like 10 times a day before. It looks like I'm washing 30, 40 times now. Telemedicine, I will focus on it a little bit. There, there has been a lot of con controversy infection control and sterility, this will be in future meetings, and the role of steroids, can we live without steroids? I used to say sometimes all our patients are addicted to opioids and we are addicted to steroids, so we have to imagine life without steroids. So this is how it looks, life is going to change. There are more webinars coming, as we said, that we had one already that is available, the recordings are available if you wanted to, if you want to watch that. And this will also be available in the recordings and you can reach us either ASIP or myself personally. You can reach through LinkedIn. LinkedIn seems to be the most popular medium right now. One of my friends was saying that uh, if he, he doesn't read that much of news anymore. He just goes on to the LinkedIn and reads everything from there, what I post. I think that is a little bit exaggeration, but that is what he was saying in any case. So this is the flattening of the curve. I think everybody is getting sick of this because we are not seeing the flattening. Uh, it is also hard to understand where we are in this uh, slope, either peak or down slope or where we are. But this uh, curve looks a little bit better here. If we look at uh, suppression versus mitigation versus do nothing early on. So if you do nothing, you have a curve there, which is towards the right. I think it should be a lot more to the right, but uh, sorry, a lot more to the left. But that is where it is in the picture. And then mitigation, then you start going towards right. The hammer, I think that is what we are doing. Everybody is having such headaches, if they are hitting them on their heads with hammer. Then we go into the dance phase. So we are hoping that phase is pretty coming soon. Somebody is changing the slides. I don't know what is happening. Oh my goodness. Who is changing the slides? Okay, please don't change the slides. Okay. 
Okay, this is various states. Uh, how many people are infected in the states? Like some of the small states are showing very high numbers. Uh, New York has over 92,000, and uh, New Jersey has over 25,000. Overall, they have 170,000 or so. There is large numbers just in two, three states. Then you come to the small states, like Indiana is a pretty small state, but they have more than Ohio. Illinois is pretty big. Missouri is pretty low. It is very hard to say where it is and who is going to be affected. Consequently, almost all states have, except three or four, lockdowns and kind of a curfew, and nobody is working, and they are working from home. Now we have all these packages which are beneficial if you don't work, and they may help people also to keep them in jobs. Just comparing from last week to this week, the worldwide deaths were 25,000 last week. This week, sorry, as of today, 120% increase to 55,000. If you take the United States, there were 1,301. Now it is 6,069, 366% increase. There may be slowing down in doubling of the numbers, but they are still growing numbers. Again, United States still continues to be number eight in reference to the total cases per one million population or total deaths per one million population. That number was extremely low. I think it was only two or four last time when I was speaking, and now it is much higher. So this is the reason nobody is lifting the restrictions. Uh, a lot of states started them on 4-6, and they're all thinking that they will be lifted on 4-6. Uh, so they are thinking that they're going to be lifting now, but they're not going to lift them. They're going to wait for a while, so, or 3-6. The individual state-wise, again, these are the active cases, deaths per million, per one million. New York had the, has the highest number of deaths followed by New Jersey, followed by California, it says. I'm not quite sure if that number is accurate. But it may be wrong. I think it's Massachusetts and California is reversed there. And these are the states with uh, partial lockdown or statewide lockdown, and white one shows no lockdown. So there are not that many states without lockdown. Now, there are a lot of packages there. We, they are calling it CARES Act. What we call it is a Coronavirus Stimulus Act at one time. It was named Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, CARES Act. In a nutshell, it does two things for us. There are a lot of other things included in this. One is payroll protection. Second one is economic injury and disaster loans. Payroll protection is the one which is accessible to all of us. <clears throat> In a few minutes, Amol will highlight on it. We can also get money from economic injury and disaster loans, but it is a lot more complicated. We have to look into that. Also, there is a healthcare relief fund of $100 billion. It is mainly for hospitals, $67 billion, and other providers, 33 billion, but they are saying it is all for the people or facilities affected by COVID virus or people who are treating those conditions. So if there is anything left over, we, sh we can get some, but I really don't think there will be. My personal estimate for the whole COVID cost for healthcare is more like $3 trillion. Last year, our healthcare budget was 3.2 trillion, so it will be pretty much in the same range. This is the first bill President signed, Families First Coronavirus Act. In this, employees are eligible for vacation or sick leave, and they can stay home with the children to take care of the COVID virus so affects them. Now, they are making a lot of uh, 
regulations were relaxing them. I don't know if they're good or bad. They are saying opioid disorder during the coronavirus, people can evaluate them on the phone and they don't have to go through induction phase and give the prescriptions over the phone. Whether it's good or bad, it is available. There are multiple other regulations, emergency declaration blanket waivers for healthcare providers. And most important one is, this is the hotly, hotly debated subject is the Medicare telemedicine healthcare provider fact sheet. President uh, Trump announced on March 17 that they were relaxing the rules and regulations. And he said, you can use video and audio or audio only or video only. But we started interpreting our own ways and we started refusing to accept what he said. Then we went to Congress and got clarification from CMS, which said that that was accurate. You can bill just for audio as if you were providing the service in the office as if they came to your office. Those, that is, those are the normal codes we use for evaluation and management services. So again, this is a clarification which came on April 1, or April 1. It said, providers also can evaluate beneficiaries who have audio phones only. Unfortunately, some of the patients don't even have audio phones, and some of them, they lose their ability to talk on the phone or the minutes first week or so. The other one is, other column is says, new as well as established patients now may stay at home and have a telehealth visit with their provider. So that is the clarification. Now when it comes to, to the billing, this will allow our systems to make appropriate payment for services furnished via Medicare telehealth, which if not, for the PHE for the COVID-19 pandemic would have been furnished in person. At the same rate, they would have been paid if the services were furnished in person. So we have received payments for some, some services and payments are the same as they were paying before. This is practical. Now we want to create more problems and we keep questioning them. What modifiers? What do we need to do this? What do we need to do that? Those are all the going to be the issues. We are going to scratch a wound. It is never going to heal. Now, having a video and audio is a great thing. This thing is not going to last. It's going to last only through June 6th. So let us have audio and video. This is the time to establish telemedicine. This is going to be the future. Large number of my patients really like on the audio part and they won't mind having video it is much better than coming to a doctor's office, waiting for two hours or so and driving one hour each way. That is four or five hour visit can be completed in 30 minutes. Now we also, when we do this, we also ask some separate questions on in reference to the coronavirus. So some people are already abusing, I think. I saw some of our practitioners do that myself, they are saying that since they are asking these questions, have you experienced a fever, chills, shortness of breath in the last two, two to four weeks, so on and so forth, those questions and you answer yes or no, hopefully mostly no, and then they are charging them a level four visit. I'm not sure it justifies for a level four visit just because you are asking those questions, but you have to document these as if this was your regular visit, starting with their symptomatology. Have, has it changed? How much pain relief they have had? What is the pain rating? How did their function do? Are they doing their exercises? Are there indications for opioid therapy or interventional techniques? What are the comorbid factors with your medical therapy or interventional techniques? You have to document all these things. Then you are fine. Just because they said they won't audit, that doesn't mean they won't. And sometimes if you really have a bizarre patterns, then they will start auditing. So one person can go and spoil it for everyone. So our goals at ASIP 
to membership is follow KISS principle. One of my friends a long time ago, orthopedic surgeon, told me that keep it simple, stupid, KISS principle <laughs> means. is also keep it simple, safe, or secure. There are lots of ways of doing, but here we changed it to keeping you informed, safe, scientific, and secure. We are going to hear a lot about how we are going to control the physician burnout and the burden. So I read a, this article the other day from Sunil Dhand. He actually takes it a different approach. Uh, he says top three reasons why some physicians are not burdened. Number one, this is all in next lecture in Maria's lecture, but this is what he said. Find a niche that you're passionate about, stay calm, be well-rounded. Just the title is different, message is the same. Now today, again, to repeat, we are, go we are going to talk about managing stress and burnout. After that, financial support, then protecting family, friends, and employees during COVID. So now I would like to introduce Maria Gloud. She is a professor of practice. She's a researcher and clinical social worker, a wonderful lady. We just I just read her article in uh, MD Links and we contacted, she immediately accepted to speak. Here is Maria. Thank you so Maria. much, Dr. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Manchikanti. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. So as you see, I've entitled today's presentation, Self-Care. I'll squeeze you in right after I see 20 more patients. And so I've done this presentation for social workers, for nurses, and I'm so thankful and grateful to be here today with you frontline workers, doctors, physicians. And the title is kind of funny, but it's not so funny that we all can relate that we make time for our patients and we don't often make time for ourselves. As Dr. Manchikanti stated, the article uh, that resulted in him reaching out to me was in MD Links. And one of the quotes that I had in the article is this one that you see on your screen here. At the end of the day, we are all human. We are resilient beings and we're wired. We're built to be resilient. We're built to handle stress, yet we all respond to stress differently. We have our own thermometers for the activation of our flight, excuse me, fight, flight, freeze response. And so that's the premise of today's conversation, um, that we are resilient and we have to take care of ourselves. I have a disclaimer here that you see before you. We all come from different disciplines and it's just a gentle reminder that these are going to be best practices, but they are not exhaustive. So be mindful of what your discipline teaches you, the laws, the ethics of your practice. So right now, I'd like everyone to take out a piece of paper and a writing utensil. And on that piece of paper, I'd like you to write down three stressors. The question is, what are the three biggest stressors you're experiencing today? I'll give you about 30 more seconds to write down a few stressors. And then I'd like you to put that paper away somewhere safe because you'll need it again. Probably a review to many of you, but I'd like to give credit to my colleague, Dr. Charles Figley. He came up with the term compassion fatigue based on his research with um, trauma victims, particularly those who were um, 
experiencing post-traumatic stress related to war. Uh, Dr. Figley is one of my colleagues at Tulane. He has been there since about 2008 um, after Hurricane Katrina. He was instrumental in helping us build our Traumatology Institute. And as you see on your screen, compassion fatigue is a state experienced by those helping people in distress. It's extreme. So this is not mild. This is extreme state of, of tension and preoccupation, and it can impair our daily lives. You, nurses, other helping professionals, as well as social workers are all helpers. As you see on your screen, the helper is traumatized or the helper suffers through their own efforts to empathize and be compassionate. So as human beings, we have reactions. And when we react to what's going on with our patients, it may contribute to poor self-care. It may result in extreme or mild symptoms, but to the point where it starts causing burnout or compassion fatigue, that's when the symptoms are concerning and that's when the symptoms mirror post-traumatic stress disorder. You don't have to be a family member. So you as physicians, you as doctors, you are people who really deeply care about your patients. You don't have to be the person being harmed like primary stress reaction. It can be secondary, which is what we often experience as helpers. Secondary traumatic stress reaction would be you as the helper caring about someone like a patient who is being harmed. So as you see, doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, clergy, military, Red Cross workers, social workers, police officers. These are all individuals who are helpers who are vulnerable to secondary stress and the traumatic effects of that stress. So I'd like you to ask yourself if you have signs of burnout or secondary traumatic stress, these include what you see on the screen before you. Sadness, depression, apathy, feeling easily frustrated, feeling isolated or disconnected from others, feeling tired, exhausted or overwhelmed. And whereas you might be thinking, I feel this on a regular day, the, the, the extreme feelings that you might be feeling right now may be a, an indicator that this is more than usual. Uh, you may even be feeling like a failure that you cannot help. And so these are indicators that something needs to be done. Other signs of secondary traumatic stress include excessive worry or fear about something bad happening, being easily startled or on guard all of the time, having physical signs of stress like a racing heartbeat, and then nightmares or recurrent thoughts about the traumatic situation. So when you're thinking about your self-assessment that you just completed, you may be thinking, you know what, I need to do something about some of the symptoms I'm experiencing. And so I'd like you to pick up the paper that you put away moments ago where you wrote down your three stressors. Next to each stressor, I'd like you to write down an action step that you would offer a colleague. We're going to pause for a moment as you write down something next to each of those three stressors. If you were able to come up with a recommendation for a colleague, that's awesome, that's excellent. If you were not, I have some tips a little bit later that may be of interest to you. If you were not able to come up with a option, then that is something that may suggest that you may need some help. That means that self-care, self-love is not something that you may be used to doing, and that makes sense as a doctor. Um, my 
advice is to be intentional and to be unapologetic. You're taking care of patients consistently and we must put our oxygen masks on first. When we're on an airplane and we're told if you're traveling with small children or traveling with someone who's disabled or, or unable to take care of themselves, you're asked to put on your mask so that you will be available to the other people on the plane. Because if you forget to take care of yourself, you may not be around to help take care of the people. Similarly here, we need you to put your oxygen masks on first. So here are some practical tips for reducing stress. As doctors, you can stay connected. You can use social networking to stay connected to family, to friends, to other people in your network. You can use technology for healthy pro-social behaviors. You can use FaceTime or other apps like Google uh, Hangout. You can use Zoom or other mediums to connect with people. Some of the creative uh, ways that people are connecting and expending extra stress or, or negative energy is having uh, dance parties, karaoke parties. And you may be thinking, I don't have time to do these things. And the, the response to that is we have to make time to do these things. We must limit exposure while staying informed. So if you're watching the news constantly, if that is what your computer um, default is showing you, that is not recommended during these times. You do need to stay informed looking at CDC information and other expert information about best practice and current research, current trends, most recent information about vaccinations, et cetera. And part of it is to limit the exposure. Constantly being exposed to those triggers could cause adverse effects within us and could cause us to um, lower our immune system and possibly become sick or impaired or unable to perform our duties. One of the recommendations that um, was in the MD Links article was also to take breaks or breathers. You can go for a walk, you can go for a run, you can get on your exercise bike, you can um, spend time with family members and take a family walk. You can um, use technology while you're spending time with a family member. We had a, a, a couple friends say, hey, let's go for a walk, we'll, we'll be six feet apart. But it, it, was, it was a very nice gesture to stay connected and to continue to support us. Um, as we know, we need to have vitamin D and we know we need to be connected to humans as fellow humans. You can walk, run, do other types of exercise to help you get rid of the extra stress. Other stress reducing tips are, uh, include accepting support. As doctors, sometimes you may feel like you are the helper that people should be able to rely on you and you should be able to accept help from others. You should be able to accept support from others because we need you healthy. We need you able to provide care to our loved ones. We need you to care for yourself as well as you care for others. And I am a telehealth provider. I uh, use a medium to provide counseling services through telehealth. And so if that is a need, there are professionals available with whom you can work. I've been providing telehealth for about five years and there is efficacy. It is effective for many people, many families, many couples. Uh, it may not be the best fit for everyone, but it is an option and it is available to you in the privacy of your own space through encrypted uh, lines, as you know, and it's a resource that you can use if your symptoms are to the point where you need higher level interventions besides those uh, best practices we just talked about. Some additional self-care, self-love activities. If you look at your paper that you were using, if you were not able to write anything next down, anything next to the stressor that you identify, you may look at some of these. You may be able to enroll in a class. You may learn a different skill, but not necessarily something related to medicine. Maybe something that would be more uh, pleasurable, like yoga. There is a um, dance party type exercise called workout. 
and then karate, karaoke, some other opportunities may be available to you. You may host a virtual party. There are some recent articles that are talking about how dance and um, dancing with others, even through virtual means, is showing some efficacy for release of stress and um, connectivity. You can create a piece of artwork using photography, crafting, things around the house. Um, you can prune, garden, get out in the yard so you can get some more vitamin D and also make your lawn look really fabulous during this time. And so these can be small, mo small moderate steps. They can be, this can be in small proportions, but doing something is what we are finding that we need to remind ourselves of. You can read or, read or write, write a blog, write a book, write a letter. You can type a letter. You can use uh, these opportunities to get in touch with a relative or friend that you haven't connected with in a while. You can also look to meditation, prayer, mindfulness. Those mediums are also pro-social behaviors uh, that promote self-care. I've also included here the website. Um, we just launched a self-care website at Tulane School of Social Work. You should see it on your screen there as HTTPS colon backslash backslash selfcaretips.tulane.edu. We have some tips there. We have resources there. And we also have these mini videos um, that promote mindfulness and they were created with a partner of ours um, as a response to our request to help us create resources for anyone during this very difficult time. And so if you see my next slide, um, I wanna hold us all responsible for promoting self-care. If you don't have an accountability partner, you might consider that. If you have residents that you're working with, um, you may teach about self-care and you might ask them to help you hold yourself accountable. My supervisee um, who is working towards full licensure is somebody that I hold as an accountability partner. She holds me accountable for my self-care. When we check in for supervision, I show her what I produced over that week and she shows me what she produced over that week. And so having an accountability partner is an excellent way um, to be mindful of the prioritization of self-care during this very difficult time and every day during the rest of your practice as physicians. So with that, I thank you. I thank you for the invitation to be here in this space with you and I encourage you all to practice self-care. Dr. Manchikot, you, you're very welcome. Uh, we already got many comments. Uh compliments on you so that's great uh, you're going to stick around for a little while right yes sir you're going to be here for a while okay thank you appreciate that now our next uh, speaker is going to be amol sign uh, he doesn't need any introduction he's the executive vice president sorry president elect of asip and uh, he will be speaking and updating us on financials or economics, the situation is changing. It is very fluid. And for example, I was telling them all that we completed the small business application last night and gave it to the banker. And we thought it was accepted. This morning, he came up with another form and asked us to refill it. So situation is very fluid. He's spending hundreds of hundreds of hours learning these things and he's helping us on this. Before that, I want to tell everyone that uh, next week we are going to have a speaker from CMS either give a speech or participate in a question answer session. We don't know that whether on Tuesday or Friday, we are going to have two of these webinars on Tuesday and Friday. They are going to be more advanced. Meanwhile, we also called Kevin Poe, Kevin MD, He's agreed to come and speak on next Friday. So it is going to be all exciting and we are going to start on new topics as we go on and how we are going to reopen the practices and survive into the future after eight weeks. 
Now, Amol. Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I want to spend the next couple of minutes just updating and discussing the financial support uh, for physicians and our practices. So we're going to go over um, a couple of things. As Dr. Montecani mentioned, some of the um, things have, have been changing um, recently. And there are a lot of options right now to capitalize your business and your practice. Um, and that's important to know. I, as we discuss and see where we're at right now, um, you, you can see that, uh, slides keep changing here. Uh, we can see that, um, you know, probably where you're at today, you know, you're probably okay just from legacy billing that you've had prior to the COVID-19 crisis. But, you know, within the next week or two, and definitely within the next month, we're all gonna start to see some significant reductions in collections. Uh, and it's going to force us into some difficult um, situations. So it's good to get ahead of it, right? And so we're going to start with the one program that has garnered a lot of attention, probably because it sounds really good, uh, and hopefully it's not too good to be true, but the Small Business Paycheck Protection Program. And as you guys know, uh, this is a, if you follow guidelines and rules that I'll go over in a minute, it is fully forgiven. Um, the key thing is that you have to keep employees on payroll or uh, if you have already let them go, you have an opportunity to rehire them uh, and retain them. All small businesses, that's in businesses with employees of 500 or less are eligible. Uh, when to apply uh, actually is today on um, April 3rd, and, and that can go over um, how to apply for that uh, as well. So let's just get into the program specifically. So the PPP authorized $349 billion um, for employees um, of, of companies um, affected by COVID-19. And all loan terms will be the same for everyone. Uh, the loans are forgiven if loan proceeds are used to cover payroll costs uh, and most mortgage interest, rent, and utility costs for the eight-week period after the loan is made. Uh, employee and compensation levels have to be maintained uh, for the duration of the, of the loan period. Um, Payroll costs are capped at $100,000 on an annual basis. Uh, so I know that affects some of us physicians based on how much um, some of us may be making. Uh, but here's the thing, not more than 25% of the loan can be used for non-payroll costs, right? So that whole section about mortgage, interest, utilities, employee benefits, et cetera, that can only be 25% of your loan or only 25% of your total loan will, can be used for that. If, if you use more than that, you still can. It just no longer is forgivable. Um, and the formula is two and a half times the last, it should be one month payroll um, here. So you take your payroll last month, for example, and you multiply that by two and a half, uh, and that's the formula that you use. Uh, or, you know, I, I think you can use a, a month prior to um, February as well. And the payments are deferred for six months. Um, so where and when to apply? Today, April 3rd, small businesses can apply through existing SBA lenders. I know a lot of you probably have gone on the internet to try to fill out applications. Uh, I've been texting a lot of people today and they've been asking me and sharing me some information. Um, and it's been interesting. Uh, in Ohio, in our particular market, um, you know, I, I contacted four or five banks uh, just to actually prepare for this talk to see what they were doing. Uh, and to be honest, of all the banks I, I contacted, which were very large banks, uh, only one of them, Bank of America, had a, a formal application process they were processing. Other banks said that they're still trying to understand the situation, and they took my information down and said they would get back to me. Uh, Steve Mnuchin talked this morning, and at about 10 a.m. or so, he said that um, around that time, the application process was open and running, and something like $2.5 million of loans had already been approved or gone through the process. And then by about noon, I think that number went up to like $4 million uh, for the whole program across the country. Now, most of those were small community banks. It seems like the larger banks are commercial lenders um, just because of their internal processes are taking a little bit more time to process these uh, applications. But basically, where do you apply for it? Your local bank, essentially, for the PPP loan. Um, most banks, small and large, are um, able to give this SBA type of a loan. On April 10th, if you're an independent contractor or self-employed individual, you can apply, obviously, April 3rd today, small businesses. 
any bank or credit union that issues SBA loans are the place to go. And if you need a list of vendors, um, there is a, a list on SBA.gov. There's a PP, PPP loan form, and I'm going to show that to you in a couple of slides, though not everyone's using it at this time. Um, some of the banks that I've talked to said that um, all the information on the loan that the SBA, that application the SBA have is what they're going to use internally, but they may ask for additional stuff, um, the bank itself. Uh, the basic background questions, you have to um, give some certifications that the money you're going to be using is going to support ongoing businesses. You have to list the poor purpose of the loan, uh, payroll, rent, mortgage interest, and you have to list the number of jobs that you have um, on the loan. So the max loan amount's um, $10 million, um, or the max is two and a half times your payroll. Uh, the suggestion is to apply soon because uh, I've been told by some of the bankers that the program may not have enough money for everyone. Uh, the window to apply is open until June 30th, but I have heard, and, and this is just anecdotally, that um, they believe that demand may out exceed the supply of money significantly, something like a four to one ratio. So if you're interested in, in doing this, you should probably, you know, do it soon. Um, and if you haven't done it already, consider getting it done next week. Um, the documentation need may be based on the lender. Some are asking for payroll reports or, or quarterly payroll tax reporting. Um, you can get a maximum of, of one loan. Uh, for your entity. And as I mentioned, uh, the loans can be used for the payroll costs, including benefits, interest on mortgage obligations before February 15th, rent or under lease before February 15th, uh, utilities under service before February 15th as well. So what actually counts as payroll? Um, salary, wages, tips capped at $100,000, and the benefits that includes costs for paternal maternal, medical, or sick leave, group health benefits, insurance premiums, retirement costs, uh, state and local taxes assessed on compensation uh, also counts. Um, you will own, owe money, though, if you don't maintain your staff. So if you let staff go, um, the forgiveness of the loan decreases. I don't know how it necessarily decreases. From what I've heard, it's a proportional decrease. Um, your loan forgiveness will be reduced uh, if you decrease your full-time employee headcount. Um, level of payroll uh, will be reduced if you decrease wages by more than 25% of any employee making less than $100,000. Rehiring. Um, you have until June 30th to rehire any staffing changes that you made from February 15th to April 26th. So if you let people go or furlough them, then uh, you, you can actually rehire them and still um, get the loan forgivable. Some important tips. Uh, you request forgiveness from the lender. Uh, and the lender should make a decision on forgiveness within 60 days of you requesting it. So you'd make the actual request to be forgiven uh, to the bank or institution where you got the loan from. Uh, that 60 days is actually memorialized in the uh, in the, the the bill. So that should be um, how quickly they they get back to you. Um, oh boy, thing has uh, moved a bit. Um, Oh, there we go. And uh, the rate uh, to the actual bank itself uh, was, when I wrote the slide, 0.5%. That's what the bank will get for actually transferring the money to you. As you know, all the money and loans are backed by um, the federal government. Uh, but I heard the payment to the bank is going to increase to 1% to entice banks to participate in the program. Uh, payments are deferred for six months. The loan is due in two years. No collateral is needed, and there's no uh, prepayment penalty. Um, the other type of uh, capitalization that you could do um, is the uh, accelerated payment program from Medicare itself. Um, and ordinarily, Medicare can uh, make advanced accelerated payments to providers when there's a disruption in claim submission and or claims processing. So this is already a rule that was in place um, of, of being able to accelerate payments. And initially it was made if there was some sort of national natural disaster like a tornado or a hurricane that prevented like mail delivery or um, back when there used to be paper claims, if there was something that prevented paper processing, uh, you could actually request this. But since that's in place, you can actually use it for this now. Um, the key takeaway is that the accelerated advanced payments are similar to an interest-free bridge loan uh, being offered through other federal programs at the moment. Under these circumstances, all Medicare providers and suppliers, um, you know, may want to consider doing this. 
Uh, who is eligible to receive this type of payment? Well, to qualify, you must have billed Medicare for claims within 180 days prior to the date of signing the request form. Uh, you have to not be in bankruptcy. You have to not be under active medical review or program integrity investigation for Medicare and not have any outstanding delinquent Medicare overpayments. Uh, these providers and suppliers who meet the qualification um, can request this, and there's actually a form uh, that you can use, which I'm going to show you on the next slide, uh, that should be available on each of your MAX website. CMS do the amount available vary from, by provider type, but basically most Part B providers will be able to request up to 100% of their historical Medi Medicare payment over a three-month period. Um, and how long does it take to receive a payment? Well, CMS has directed each MAC to review and process each request and issue payment within seven calendar days of receipt of the request. And if you see on the bottom of the form, um, which I'll show you here now, uh, this is the, the CMS form for CGS, which you know is uh, Ohio and Kentucky's jurisdiction. Uh, on the very bottom, there's an email address that you just email this form to. It is literally just this one sheet that you have to fill out. So it doesn't take very long at all to do. Um, you're obviously going to check that you are part of uh, Medicare Part B, um, and you're going to check the second box here um, that uh, that states that there's a delay in provider billing process of an isolated temporary nature beyond the provider's normal billing cycle. And then you fill out the rest of this stuff here. <clears throat> And then the CMS is um, extending the repayment to begin 120 days after the accelerated advance payment has been issued. During the 120-day period, providers and suppliers will receive full payment for their claims submitted. At the end of the 120-day period, the recruitment, pro the recruitment process will commence. At that point, every claim submitted will be offset from the new claims to repay the accelerated payment loan that you got. So hospitals have a year to repay the balance. After a year, they start, you know, recouping the money. But all other Part B suppliers um, will have a total of 210 days uh, to repay. Mm -hmm. You can actually get information um, about the Accelerated Payment Program, uh, like at cms.gov. If you type in or Google Accelerated and Advanced Payment Fact Sheet, there's actually a fact sheet that goes over it. But um, it's a good program, right? It's an interest-free uh, bridge loan uh, type of situation, um, and you can see the um, the one sheet that you have to fill out. There's a third program out there, too. Um, that's the SBA disaster loan. Um, so that's different than the SBA PPP loan. Um, instead of going to a commercial lender, you actually go to the SBA website, which I, I took a picture of my iPhone here. Uh, and so if you type in like SBA or Small Business Administration disaster loans, you can see that there and there's literally a, a, a icon that you click to apply for a disaster loan. The disaster loan is different. Um, it's different than the PPP. Uh, you can get up to $2 million as determined by the SBA based on your ability to repay that loan. Uh, it can be used for working capital for operations, paid sick leave, payroll, increased material costs due to supply chain, pay obligations due to revenue loss or rent and mortgage. You do have to supply collateral for this type of loan if the loan is greater than $25,000. And then you have to supply a, a personal guarantee or a guarantee if the loan is above $200,000. So there is interest accrued by this type of loan. 3.75% uh, for businesses like small businesses and 2.75% interest rate for nonprofits. There is no uh, participation or prepayment fees. The terms of the loan are not to exceed 30 years. Uh, but one thing that's really cool is that you can get up to $10,000 that can be forgivable as a grant. Um, if you do select this option to get that $10,000 grant that's forgivable, um, that $10,000 will be deducted from your total amount if you actually apply for the PPP program. Uh, but this grant money is supposed to be available quickly. It's actually easy to apply for it. So if you wanted a quick $10,000, um, you can actually go to the SBA website and request that, and it would not uh, impact your eligibility for the PPP. However, it would that amount would be deducted from your 
um, total forgivable amount um, in that loan. The forgivable loan, the Paycheck Protection Program, basically ends up as a grant from the federal government as long as you follow the guidelines. So I strongly encourage you guys to definitely look at that to see if that's a possibility for you. Now, there's another option, obviously, as we look at what we're going to do with our practice. If you decide not to do the Medicare Advanced Payment, which is basically an interest-free bridge loan, if you don't want to do the SBA Disaster Loan or the PPP, and that's to start furloughing your staff, uh, and you can place them on unemployment. Um, unemployment, I mean, obviously, you can reduce some of your overhead costs by doing that. Um, it's state to state. Here's a picture of Ohio on how you file claims that are done weekly. Um, and uh, obviously, if you furlough your staff uh, in the state of Ohio, if they file an unemployment claim, they can get up to a total of $533 a day. It's based on how much you earn or up to a salary of like $113,000 per year. Uh, but you only get about 50% of your actual real payroll. Um, so um, that's there. Although in the CARES Act, there was some additional employment and unemployment insurance offered by the federal government to help patients that are on unemployment, although it's not clear how that would look. Um, just briefly, I wanted to go over the federal stimulus package. I want to do this in the last webinar, but I was running low on time. Um, but these were as of when I initially drafted these slides, um, it hadn't passed the Senate. But there's some important things to know about. Um, there's the direct payments to most American taxpayers. Individuals who earn 75000 or less uh, would get direct payments of about 1200 each. Married couples earning up to 150000 will receive $2,400. An additional $500 uh, per child will be tacked onto that. Uh, the payment... <coughs> Would scale down as income levels rises, phasing out entirely at 99,000 for singles or 190,000 for couples without children. 90% um, of Americans would be eligible to receive full or partial payment, <clears throat> including, uh, according to the estimates of the Tax Policy Center. Uh, it's unclear how long that's going to take to process, although they were saying it could happen as soon as April 6th. That doesn't really look like it's going to happen. Um, here's another thing they're expanding the unemployment insurance. Uh, so lawmakers have agreed to a significant expansion of unemployment benefits that would expand unemployment insurance by 13 weeks and include a four-month enhancement of benefits, an additional $600 per week on top of what state unemployment programs pay. So furloughing your employees, if you didn't want to take any loans, you could actually still do that. And assuming this provision kicks in, um, you wouldn't be hurting them too much um, compared to, to a normal situation. In total, unemployed workers are eligible to receive up to 39 weeks of unemployment benefits. Um, the program was expanded to include freelancers, uh, gig workers like Uber drivers, um, and of course the mass massive boost is going to cost $250 billion. We already talked about the uh, small business loans, so I'm going to um, skip over that. Uh, larger companies will get cash. Um, Chuck Schumer put a specific restriction against the truck Trump family um, inside the, uh, the the bill, and there are no stock buybacks uh, as well. Um, so I see on my questions that are popping up as as I'm talking here. I mean, there's a lot of questions about telemedicine and and uh, this whole um, payroll pro paycheck protection program, et cetera. And a lot of those we'll be able to, if you guys stick around, uh, we'll be able to answer a lot of those in the Q&A section. Uh, there's one question about what do you do if you work for a hospital or what do you suggest for um, hospital physicians that are RVU-based? Um, uh, hospitals under crisis are going to be receiving aid, too, as part of the CARES Act. Uh, there's a massive package that includes $100 billion in assistance for hospitals and health care systems across the nation. Um, so I don't know. Um, you know, how much, um, you know, we'll, we'll go to your hospital, how much we'll filter down to you. Uh, but, you know, there's there's money there that's supposed to be able to subsidize some of this stuff. Um, but it, it's unclear on what hospitals will be directed to do with that particular capital um, itself. Um, and so that's all I have for, for my topic. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Manchikani. Amal, uh, thank you. That is wonderful. You already answered one of the questions uh, or two of the questions. That's good. Uh, Amit is not here yet, so we will talk a few more things. I just want to stress on this uh, point that when you are applying for this uh, loan, it says that 
30 days. What is your balance today? And what are you expecting in the next 30 days? And what is going to be your deficit? So you may not have any deficit if because you are collecting from past month when we did work it. So what we did is that we changed the 30 days to 90 days there, and we are giving the 90 day expectation of the money coming back. Most of the times, the first month after you stop the practice, we are going to get 50% of the collection rate, and next month, maybe 30% or 40%, and third month, 30% or so. If you calculate like that, you will develop a deficit. It is not for purposes of de deficit, but that is the only way you will get the money because they're going to give you only three month collections, not any more than that. So that is the point there. We are working in the Congress. Uh, we submitted a request to expand these uh, benefits, Medicare advancement. We are asking them to give six months of Medicare payments or 125% of three month payments. We are also asking for to repayment to start after six months, 180 days. And when they take the repayment, they will slowly take over a period of six months rather than three months. So you won't run into cash flow issues. As Amol said, for hospitals, it is one year. I don't understand why it should be only three months for us, at least in between it should be six months. They're also paying the hospitals 125%. So I'm thinking we should be paid the same way. And they also pay up to one year of Medicare collection if they request it and they approve it. The second one work we are doing is the S3395. This is a Senate bill which was supposed to have been included in the major stimulus package, but somehow it did not happen. Now we reintroduced it and we are trying to pass this bill. If this bill passes, what it does is it gives you a total three month collection, not just Medicare, all three month collection from January 1st to March 31st. And then you will have two years to pay it back and if you collect if you took million dollars from them and you collected only 200, you pay back only 200. If you collected 800, you pay back 800. If you collected more than million, then you pay back more than million, but you have two years to do so. So these are the one things we are working. We are also working in Congress in reference to expanded umbilical cord stem cells and exosomes for COVID-19 pneumonia this is going to be exciting treatment. We are very close to submitting protocols, et cetera. Under the Emergency Act, if they approve it, so this can be administered probably within two to four weeks, two to three weeks or four weeks or six weeks. I think we will still be needing these treatments after six weeks. Now, I have the message that uh, Amit uh, Mahajan is here. So we will go ahead and start his lecture. He's a assistant. He's an assistant professor of radiology and biomedical imaging at Yale University of Medicine. He has an interesting background. He's internal medicine and also infectious disease control, radiology, biomedical imaging, and neuroradiology. We welcome. Amit Mahajan, Amit, please start. Yeah, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, Dr. Manchikanti, for the invite. Uh, and is this my first slide visible to all? Yes. All right, just to, um, so I can start off here. Uh, thank you for the invitation and to speak to you guys. Um, um, I mean, uh, I'm, I have, uh, been uh, in practice for a while. I'm first in internal medicine and infectious diseases, and now uh, I'm predominantly doing radiology, but uh, uh, I have a big interest in uh, pain procedures as well as a part of my neuroradiology uh, practice as well. So um, so let's get started. Um, so we uh, went over these statistics with Dr. Manche uh, uh You guys um, know all the uh, numbers by now. 
uh, we have around more than a million uh, worldwide cases, more than uh, a quarter of a million cases in the U.S. by now, more than 6,000 deaths. Our numbers surpass uh, those of any other country in the world. Uh, nothing to be proud of, but uh, that's the situation. And uh, we have uh, cases, uh, as we said, the Western world is uh, expanded much more than where it started in China. And uh, uh, obviously, in this list, we should also today uh, include Germany, which has surpassed China as well. So obviously, a big problem. And uh, I was looking at uh, the previous talks that Dr. Manchikanti did, and his goal was to know as much about the enemy. And uh, so that is my goal as well. So I just wanted to reiterate that and uh, uh, try and um, expand on that uh, theme. So. The virus, as we know, is an enveloped virus. That means that it has a membrane around it. And uh, these are the spike proteins that uh, uh, everyone's talking about nowadays, these little spiky things on the surface of the uh, virus itself, uh, which is responsible for uh, the virus sticking to our uh, um, body, as well as uh, this is the uh, uh, spike for which we are trying to make all the vi uh, antivirals and the, um, especially the vaccines. Uh, so that uh, we can attack uh, this spike protein, uh, which can be helpful to um, uh, achieve immunity against going forwards. So these are the little spike proteins. And um, uh, the um, it is a RNA virus. I think uh, we, in the next slide, uh, I go into more detail about what the virus is all about. So in this image, as we see this uh, uh, lollipop looking things um, are the uh, spike proteins, the S. And then the HE is the heme agglutination uh, protein. The M is the membrane protein. And uh, then uh, we have the uh, single-stranded RNA within the uh, virus itself. Now, the RNA has a little new uh, proteins along with it called the uh, nucleocapsids, which are along with the um, RNA. And uh, you will hear a lot of uh, things in the uh, news media and uh, other things. So I'm just trying to uh, clarify those things uh, or what do they mean. And then uh, they, they will, uh, there's also this thing about it's the uh, RNA itself is a positive sense RNA. That means the RNA itself uh, use, is used as a template, almost like an mRNA to produce its proteins. And uh, so the researchers nowadays have gone ahead and uh, uh, into more detail about this spike protein. And this is the example of the spike protein. So the spike protein itself is a trimer that basically there are three different molecules which kind of uh, coalesce together. And um, I think uh, last uh, week, uh, uh, Dr. Manjikanti mentioned that the receptor in the human body is something called the ACE2. Um, uh, this purple thing on top is the ACE2 molecule on the, um, which is present on the human cells, especially the respiratory cells. But it is also present in the uh, kidney and um, also in the gut. And uh, if you look in this uh, round uh, coin looking um, things in which the, uh, the white thing on top is the, um, is the ACE2 receptor, and this is kind of the cryo-electron microscope image showing the uh, ACE2 receptor on top and the, um, and the uh, uh, sp spike protein just below it. So you can see how uh, beautifully they've shown this fusion of these two molecules, uh, which uh, leads to the uh, pathogenesis of this disease. And um, Okay, so once it enters the cell, uh, this is the virus itself attaching to the receptor, and uh, thereafter the virus enters the cell and then uses its RNA to make all these little proteins, which are these uh, horizontal bars, and uh, find these things kind of coalesce together and go back into this uh, um, uh, into this shell kind of thing, and from there it goes to the membrane and is extruded out into the um, environment. So the um, interesting thing is that the entire process happens within the cytoplasm, and you can see that it did not involve the nucleus of the cell at all. And uh, it just uh, it does it in the cytoplasm itself. And that is the, uh, the way it kind of attacks our body. Okay, so what happens when it attacks our body? Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, we are hearing about uh, the usual symptoms. This is one uh, specific case in which, uh, the, I think this is the first case in the US uh, an imported case, a patient came from uh, China and uh, started coughing. And this orange bar on top is the uh, duration of the cough, which seems to continue. And then there's this less yellow uh, in the, the fourth on the top is this less yellow line, which is the fatigue. So a lot of 
cough and fatigue, also fever, which is the first line, seem to continue for a long, long time. Less of nasal congestion and rhinorrhea, and uh, also a little bit of nausea, vomiting, some diarrhea, and abdominal discomfort. And uh, this is some uh, more some more data. This is from the China uh, the Chinese studies of more than thousand patients. And as we see, um, most of the age group that was affected was 50 to 64 year age group, and um, less so females, around 42 percent females, 58 uh, percent males, and uh, the median incubation uh, period is around uh, four days, and it's a little bit of range here. And uh, if we keep continuing on the same theme, uh, what about the symptoms? So the symptoms matched with those um, bars that we saw, in which uh, mostly a lot of uh, Headache and uh, sorry, most of uh, mostly a lot of cough and uh, uh, sputum production, as well as uh, uh, respiratory symptoms and fever, uh, rather than um, uh, other symptoms. And um, as not many signs, there are usually uh, not many signs on exams. This is mostly the fever and, and uh, cough and respiratory distress. Radiological findings, um, uh, as seen here, uh, may show up on the CT scan as these little ground glass opacities which are uh, shown in these boxes in these blue colored boxes on the uh, images of the cat scan and um, okay so once besides the symptomatic patients which obviously are going to present to the hospital uh, there's a big talk and a big concern about asymptomatic transmission and how important this is i think it is very important is because and this is what is driving the epidemic, uh, and we all know that and have been listening to that in the news media as well. So I was going to present you some evidence regarding that. So this is a study in Iceland. This is being done right now in which they have tested. I mean, Iceland is a closed country. Not a lot of people uh, move around. Um, so they have been able to test their population much better. So they um, tested around 18,000 people and around, which is around 5% of the population. And they only found a virus in less than one person, which was around a thousand patients, and of these, fifty percent were asymptomatic. So that shows you how uh, um, how much of asymptomatic transmission could happen uh, with this disease. So this is kind of an interesting um, study to uh, uh, help us. Uh, this is another example of a patient. The uh, orange bar on top was a, a patient from China who visited Germany. And uh, this arrow in the uh, this says flight to China. So this is, at this point she was totally asymptomatic. She developed symptoms after landing in China, and then her, she her PCR turned positive. Now the next two lines, the yellow line and the green line, are two patients she interacted with, and at which point she was totally asymptomatic. And but these two patients turned out positive and developed symptoms and um, were positive on PCR. And the next two lines, patient three and four, are the contacts of these two people, which basically um, they developed the infection from these first two uh, infected patients. So just showing how important asymptomatic transmission is uh, for the uh, propagation of this disease. I think we can ignore this slide for now. Okay, what about viral shedding? And now a lot of not we don't have a lot of data on viral shedding before in the asymptomatic period because it's hard to test at that point. We're not doing a lot of asymptomatic testing here. But uh, on the studies in which they have done viral shedding, they found a lot of pharyngeal shedding, especially very high in the first week uh, of the um, disease with a peak on the fourth day. And the virus is isolated from the throat and lung drive samples, and but not so from the stool samples. And they also um, found no virus in the blood and urine in these studies. And the shedding outlasted the end of symptoms. So that means it continued beyond the symptoms <coughs> coming down. And there was also zero conversion in which the antibodies started to appear after six to 12 days. But this was not followed by a rapid uh, uh, um, decrease in viral load. So that is concerning for uh, vaccine development going forward. OK. Uh, as far as persistence of cor coronavirus is concerned, in an analysis of 22 studies on uh, inanimate surfaces, uh, they found that um, the virus could survive on inanimate surfaces, uh, metal, glass, plastic for nine days. But this is before uh, the current um, coronavirus. And it could be easily uh, inactivated within one minute by alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, or sodium hypochlorite, less so by benzyl uh, chloride and chlorhexidine. 
And this is the study which all the news media uh, are quoting in which they're looking at the virus in the aerosol and on different surfaces. The uh, red bars are the uh, current virus. The blue bars, uh, the blue um, charts are the one with the old SARS virus. And you can see that the ones on the uh, right hand side are plastic and stainless steel in which it seems to persist longer as compared to the um, uh, as compared to copper and uh, and, uh, and cardboard. The third one is uh, the uh, graph of cardboard. So <clears throat> finally, how do we uh, uh, protect against all these uh, uh, things that are coming at us, and, uh, this asymptomatic transmission, and the patients who are um, increasing number of patients uh, who have the disease now? So a couple of tips for protection is, one is the social distancing, which we are obviously doing um, um, right now. The other things are like things like mindfulness and cleanliness, which is a, a part of our life, but I think re-emphasizing re it is not um, uh, totally um, out of the question. So things uh, which we're doing with social distancing include lockdown, stay at home, six feet distance, <coughs> excuse me, avoid handshakes with people. Um, I totally love Dr. Manchikanth's ideas from promoting Namaste. And this, uh, this, in fact, this image is from um, um, the uh, one of the uh, brochures from AIMS in India who are trying to promote Namaste actively. And this is in an in international business uh, uh, magazine that uh, they had this uh, ad out. And um, other uh, ways of doing it, the Japanese way of um, uh, head bowing, which is could be used effectively as well. And the finally is the use of masks. Obviously, it has become a big political uh, issue in the last few days. And, uh, and now, as we all know, that that Mr. Bush is, um, not Bush, Mr. Trump is pushing us or helping us uh, achieve, uh, uh, get masks for everyone, uh, even the uh, common people. Okay, as far as quandary for healthcare professionals, I think a couple of things which we should uh, remember is things I've divided them into three. One is like things when we, uh, what we do when we're getting out of the home, second, when we're outside, and third, when we're coming back in. So we've kind of d divided our uh, thought process into those three uh, ways. So when getting out, we should have a plan of what are we gonna do, uh, where are we gonna go, how, who are we gonna interact with, and how are we gonna uh, manage uh, these interactions. We should use uh, removable clothing, which we can be uh, discard in the garage when we come back use protective material uh, like gloves and masks. Uh, we already uh, talked about masks and uh, gloves may also help in uh, reducing transmission via uh, for, for mites. And also while we're outside, uh, try avoid surfaces and uh, touching our own skin uh, as we're doing that. And while it works, especially you guys are doing a lot of procedures, uh, definitely use masks, use gloves, gowns, face shields, shoe covers, use total hand hygiene, soap and water or 61% uh, alcohol rinses. Also clean up, uh, cleaning up of work areas. And while doing procedures, also clean the lead as you guys use that uh, in, uh, in IR related procedures, cover with uh, disposable gown if you can. And this is uh, out of a radiology journal in which uh, they are showing uh, things to be done at the level of the patient, at the level of the medical staff and uh, for the environment. And this is out in a, a JACR uh, journal, which uh, um, you should uh, go through to uh, get more uh, detail about it. And this is an interesting study from uh, Hong Kong in which uh, they had, in the previous SARS epidemic, they looked at patients who got infected, uh, the healthcare workers who got infected. And it was interesting that um, people, uh, this is the, the column on the left is the infected staff, and uh, people who got infected were once who did not use one type of protection out of these four, which is masks, gloves, gowns, and hand washing. So you had to use all four of those, and then you had no infection as compared to, um, if you missed any of these, you would be uh, developed an infection with the um, uh, previous SARS virus. Okay, also uh, shopping, we've been telling people not to shop, but obviously we have to shop uh, for food. So a uh, couple of things to think of is reduce the number of shopping trips, use mask and gloves, wash hands periodically, uh, also use alcohol-based uh, uh, scrubs if you have to. Uh, clean groceries and containers when coming back, especially come, uh, clean or discard the mail packages will come uh, in the mail as well. I think uh, those will are small tips which can help us um, 
uh, protect our families and uh, our employees. And finally, even coming back inside the house using disposable clothes like scrubs, shoes, etc., which can be left in the garage, um, and uh, have a bath after coming back from work, and or um, at least wash the arms and face uh, as we're coming back into our homes. And finally, uh, in the summary, in the COVID-19 is a, obviously a very infectious. Um, uh, in fact, uh, it's very infectious as we have seen in our uh, um, uh, surroundings by now. It can be spread through asymptomatic carriers, as uh, the evidence that I showed you. And uh, so, the best way is to uh, minimizing risk is by social distancing, by using mindfulness, planning our daily activities, and finally using uh, precautionary measures both at work and at home. Uh, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. That is a great talk. Uh, we already got many comments, uh, nice comments on that. Uh, we will start with your questions. Uh, the first question is, six feet distance has no real science I read. The flu particle travels much longer than six feet in air. Why is six feet still being promoted? Yeah, I think that's, um, um, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of uh, um, chatter as well as talk on the uh, social media platforms. And uh, there is this study which came out uh, two days or, uh, of, or at least four or five days back in which uh, this is, there's this lady from MIT who is showing that um, um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, when we talk, we are making all these aerosols. And as also when uh, someone sneezes, the distance can travel much more than uh, what is being told um, uh, by our uh, healthcare uh, uh, people and the um, federal level, and uh, I, I think I have a feeling these things will change as time goes by, and uh, I think it's just a matter of uh, enough people talking about it and uh, saying that. I mean, three days back we had no uh, no talk about masks for common people. Now we are, uh, our president is telling us to put uh, cloth masks at least. So I think these are things, uh, I mean, for so many years, we have not talked about these things. I think this is the time at which we are doing all these little experiments and showing that we need more than what we knew about it in the past. as we reconnect with Dr. Mangiacanti. Can you everybody hear me? Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, but I don't know what happened there. The next question is, do dogs and animals transmit COVID? Oh, just for me? Um... Um, yes, I, I think uh, we we don't know for sure, but I'm sure it can. I mean, uh, if they if they um, if they have um, um, if they can grow there, then obviously they can transmit to us as well. Although I don't think it has been proven yet. Okay. Yes, uh, I was going to make a comment on that six feet distance. We are having hell of a time even maintaining six feet distance. I don't think we can do the 27 feet like uh, he was telling. It will be pretty hard to follow it. I think I will stick to six feet, which is pretty difficult. <laughs> there is another question on, uh, because chlorohexidine was not as effective, should that be used in patients preoperatively in COVID cases? That is what we use for most of the time for prepping. So is, that is the question. But do we have COVID cases in which we've had to do uh, procedures? I mean, 
I have a feeling uh, we won't get as many patients to our, uh, I mean, uh, if someone has COVID, I'm sure we're not going to be, I mean, even in our neuroradiology practice, we're like, you know, uh, we're talking about uh, like LPs and stuff that we, uh, I mean, I, I don't think we're going to get a lot of people like that. But if we do, then obviously we'll have to use something else. Than, like, uh, like you have an asymptomatic patient or you don't know and you end up doing, that means we have to institute a different protocol for everyone. So <laughs> then it gets expensive, like everybody was wearing a N95 mask. So. Okay. The, there is a question on what specific guidelines do you suggest for in-office procedures for patients trying to, to seek, seek care for uncontrolled pain? We will answer this. Uh, it is a very difficult. It all depends on your state regulation. Uncontrolled pain is not an emergency. Only emergencies, recognized emergencies in pain are related to uh, a infected pump or infected stimulator or pump refills. Those are the approved procedures. There may be few others we can argue until cows come home, but it depends where you are, what state you are in. Like in Kentucky, it specifically says office procedures. And in uh, Ohio, Dr. Boswell was saying yesterday that life or limb so each state has different regulations, and some people are still practicing. Uh, Kentucky governor issued a ruling yesterday that uh, there is shortage of uh, PPE, and anybody doing the procedures can be prosecuted for holding. But then this morning I get a call that they are still doing that. So it is very difficult to do and control these things, and you have to depend on what you are doing. There is a question on, can atypical symptoms be related to COVID-19, and is it appropriate to quarantine employees if they exhibit these symptoms? I would say yes, but what do you think? Yeah, yeah I would say yes. I, mean, uh, I would err on the side of caution than, uh, uh, than uh, you know, let them work. I mean, I think it's better to... Um, send them home, get it tested, then uh, um, quarantine or, uh, for 19 days. Or quarantine. It says 14, yeah, quarantine but I say 19. 14 days. Okay. Well, if with 14 days, they showed in the study that 10% uh, of them can still be false negative or positive afterwards. So that's why I extended it, was, it to 19. So. And there was a Chinese... Yeah, there was a uh, Chinese case report of people um, who developed an infection after 19 days of exposure as well. So there are outliers which uh, may happen, which I think we should be ready for. Okay, Amit, you have another question. Amit, can you please show the radiolog radiological changes seen in COVID? Yeah. Uh, you really can if you already have it on here you can show but otherwise you can't put a new slide on here so this is from nilesh but i have this one. Send you an email you can oh you have one okay. yeah you see this um uh, if in this these boxes these blue boxes and if this thing in the center is the heart so if this is the lung on the uh, the two black things on the each side of the heart is the uh, lungs and this uh, within this box are these little we call them ground glass opacity. It's like, you know, uh, the glass through which you can't see. That's called a ground glass. So these things are like hazy opacities in the uh, lung, uh, which you see. Like this, another one in the posterior aspect next to the rib. <coughs> Excuse me. So those are like the ground glass opacities that we talk about. The image on top is a, a very mild infection, so it's hard to see it's if you look carefully in the boxes you can see it and the image on the bottom is the um a worse uh, situation in which you can see much more uh, uh, white opacities in the lung itself so those are the uh, like the um, and so if it gets worse and it involves the entire lung then it can lead to uh, this condition the ARDS that they talk about 
adult uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome which is basically when you have to intubate this patient basically if the infection gets so bad that uh, the patient is not able to breathe anymore then that is the point in which which we will need the ventilator to help him breathe while these uh, findings are getting better on their own there are multiple questions in relation to the telephone follow ups uh, yes telephone follow ups can be done on any patient you can even do that on the new patients but i don't understand how to justify a physical examination component even if you are doing with uh, video that will be very difficult to do the video component uh, with uh, just audio in addition you cannot give narco opioids uh, on the visit if the patient was not established you can issue opioids and they are mandating that all prescriptions be electronic uh, we just got a notice from Kentucky Board of Medical Licensure and Kentucky Health Department all states are getting that uh, the modifier there is a question on modifier if you want the location modifier place of service is 02 that is not required by insurance department health criteria modifiers are 95 or tt one or the other not both so so far we have not faced any problems uh, in our practice we have about 14 clinics or so we have built quite a few visits on this we are doing only the follow up visits we are not doing uh, new patient visits new patient visits only facilitate you for future appointments then you can go ahead and see them and schedule them but don't jump into don't feel sorry with your soft heart and go and start giving them opioids on the phone then that is going to get you into trouble mm-hmm. and the next question is if the employees are reduced to part time hours do, we, do you still qualify for the ppp this is to amir i think amol can answer this question please amol yeah sure um thank you great question um you will lose a portion of your forgiveness if you counted that patient's full salary as part of the equation used to get the money you will not waive all of the forgiveness of it but you will lose that proportion of it um So the answer to your question is yes. Uh and quite honestly, they're so clear about wanting to protect people's paychecks. I think if you were to do something that would harm one of your employees' paychecks, it's going to hurt your chances to uh get forgiveness substantially if you just think of the name of the program and the philosophy behind it. At the mm-hmm. end of the day, the actual lender, uh your bank is the one who makes the decision on forgiveness. Um, they're given the rubric from the government to actually follow. Um but yeah, those are all factors to consider. Okay, next question is if you furlough our employees, if we furlough our employees, we won't be able to use the SBA loan. Is that accurate? It is accurate to an extent if you hire them back before June 30th or yeah you have a a window to hire them back i think it's April 26th or or something like that i believe it's April 26th you have until up until June 30th to apply for the loan but if you hire them back then you can actually use that in your calculation formula to apply for the loan and get that loan amount and have that as a forgivable portion of your loan. So to answer your question, if you have furloughed your employees, as long as they were hired and working for you prior to February 15th, you can rehire them and include their salary as part of your PPP application and uh if you retain them, that will be forgivable. Okay, next question uh Okay, if PP is received as a grant and for 2020 year 2020 practice makes profit does PPP grant needs to be paid back 
so as long as you follow the actual um, guidelines, and that is 75% of your loan has to be for payroll expenses. The other 25% of that can be used for stuff like mortgage interest or rent or utilities uh, or other things, then regardless of your profitability, it'll be forgiven. So even if you're profitable, it still will be forgiven as long as you follow the guidelines I just mentioned. Okay, another question is, we stopped doing interventional pain procedures and employees are getting only 30 hours instead of 36 hours or 40 hours. Would we still be eligible? Yes, you're still eligible. And again, it, it depends on how you fill out your application. So if you want to maximize your benefit of a forgivable loan, you want them on the maximum number of hours per week possible because that's the formula that you'll use on the SBA form. And, you know, I, ha I have the form right in front of me, and it's very simple. It says average monthly payroll in one box, and then times 2.5 equals the loan amount. Um, so you can actually increase their hours to 36 hours if you wanted to pay them more and get more grant money. But you have to understand, basically, that grant money flows from the government to the bank to you and then to the employee. It's not like that extra six hours you would you would have, you could keep that money, you really can't. That money ends up just flowing through you to the employee. So for you, for your, you strategically, you will see no financial benefit of um, you know having six more hours of payroll because that money is earmarked to the particular employee. However, your employee would see that benefit and potentially they could provide six more hours of work for you during the week doing something that could benefit your uh, organization. Okay, next question is, could a new employee who has worked less than 60 days be fired and not be rehired, but replaced with a new employee, would this satisfy the PPP requirement? That is an excellent question that I don't know the specific answer to because I've heard conflicting things. Um, the actual form I can tell you, which is the SBA form 2483, uh, just lists number of jobs. And I've heard from a lawyer who told me that as long as your headcount and payroll dollar amount stays the same, it will be forgiven. But I don't know for sure. So I don't want to miss. I would suggest, you know, you consult a, an attorney or, or your actual lender about that um, since they will be the ones forgiving the loan. Okay, next question. If this situation extends beyond the eight weeks of payroll supplied by the PPP, can you lay off employees after the eight weeks, say mid-July, and still have the loan for, forgiven as a grant if all other requirements are upheld are met that's an, that's an excellent question and from how i understand it and again you know i i may be incorrect so you can always consult your banker or lawyer that if you do that yes this only protects for eight weeks if you fire them after that or or cut their payroll even though you only get eight weeks of money you will lose a portion of your forgivability which, you know, they're only subsidizing for that eight-week portion. But as I understand it, you're still obligated to, um, to keep your employees. How long are you supposed to keep them? I don't know the actual um, answer to that question um, in terms of how long you, you have to keep them. But one thing I will say is that you can request for forgiveness of your loan. Um, and the bank has to comply to that within 60 days, right? So strategically, it would make sense to me to um, carry your employees for that two-month time period. And once you've reached that, to request for forgiveness at that time. Uh, I don't know the strategic oh, advantage of holding on. I don't, I, yeah, I don't know the strategic advantage of holding on to that 
request for a long time to you. In other words, once you've burned through that money, uh, you might as well request for forgiveness. Okay. Next question is uh, for EPCS, uh, that is electronic uh, prescriptions for controlled substances, telemedicine is mandatory or virtual phone calls is okay? Virtual phone calls are okay. Only the problem is that you can also give opioids uh, on this phone call, but you can't, just can't do that for the new patient. It has to be established patient. Next question is, will CMS and other insurance reimburse telehealth at the same rate for audio visual as audio only? That's correct. Uh, you will get the same reimbursement either way. Right now you get 100% of as if you are seeing them in person. Mm -hmm. Next question is, Surgeon General order states telemedicine and EPCS for only existing patients and refill. Is that means no new controlled substance or new patients be treated? I think we just answered that in the last question. Can you bill 99213 for a phone visit if you are not ready for televisits? That's correct, you can. Why not to do time-based billing? I think you can do it, but then you have to prove that you spent so much time and then you also have to still meet the other criteria. Time-based billing is mostly for the people who don't meet this other criteria, but then they want to share coordination for 50% of the time. I'm not really quite certain in 15 minutes how much of care coordination you will be performing and counseling. So personally, I would just prefer that you meet two components especially if you are giving opioid prescription and now with the risk of uh, coronavirus and you will definitely meet moderate uh, with moderate uh, com complexity follow up visit that is 99213 once you go to 99214 then it be becomes complicated again is there any relief for RVU-based employed physicians? I think, Amol, you answered it. you want to answer again? Um, yeah. So, first of all, I, I want to clarify one thing about the rehire date. Um, you have until June 30th to restore your full-time employment. Um, and uh, thanks to Dr. Cordner, who sent me that, uh, that message. Uh, regarding RVU-based employee, employees, um, part of the stimulus package was a subsidy given to hospitals. However, there weren't any restrictions on how they can actually spend or allocate that money. Um, so I don't know if RVU-based employees will, will benefit from that subsidy. And also, you know, some areas are, are going to be hit harder than others, uh, you know, like, um, New York is obviously, those hospitals are undergoing a lot of expenses to care for these patients, though hopefully, you know, those things will be compensated from what we hear. Um, and other areas have empty ICUs, so it, it just depends on how the money flows in that scenario. Next question is, I have a small regenerative practice that only my wife, who is an MD, and I run. I have no employees, but do I have... I do have expenses, rent, et cetera. Can I claim anything as grant, as a grant? I think he's meaning that if, if, can he apply for PPP, and if so, can he claim it as a grant? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the question. Can you um, Can you repeat it? Okay. Okay. I have a keep question keeps moving because new questions are coming. I have a small regenerative practice that only my wife who is an MD and I run. That means they have two employees. Even though they are self employed, I have no employees. But I I do have expenses. Of course everybody has expenses just so can I claim anything as a grant? My understanding uh, is he can get a PPP and then both of them are still employed, then they can claim it as a grant, right? 
that is correct, um, up to an annualized salary of $100,000. Right. So you'd want to maximize that for your, you know, your eight weeks for you and your wife. And then remember, another 25% can be used for other stuff um, that, that's still forgivable. Uh, as I mentioned, utilities, mortgage interest, rent, et cetera. So to fully maximize your benefit, you probably want to do some math to account for the $100,000 annualized for you and your wife plus the extra 25% for other stuff, and that could be forgivable. Okay, next question is, uh, my spouse OBGYN employed by a hospital who just closed their OB department and fired all the employee physicians employed physicians. Her last day is next week. She was planning an opening a private office across town, starting overhead with another OBGYN sharing overhead, I believe. But now that agreement is uncertain. Would she be eligible for a loan for her unrecoverable income? Well, she's eligible for a couple of things. First of all, um, you know, obviously applying for unemployment is a smart thing to do, especially because whatever state she's in, have her state benefit, plus the additional federal insurance that comes from the CARES Act would likely help her get some capital. Um, the problem with the SBA loan, the disaster loan is what I'm thinking, not the PPP, is you actually need a business entity to apply for one of those loans um, specific to uh, the covid crisis, if she already had an LLC or something or some sort of vehicle created, um, she would be allowed to, to go with that. However, if not, she would just have to get a conventional loan uh, from the bank um, for that. Okay. There is a question on any update from NARCAL's position on procedures um, this, um, in, the, in, mid, in the middle of COVID-19. Based on my understanding and the last email I received from them, they were covering all COVID-related. But uh, yesterday, Dr. Devi was mentioning again, COVID-related excludes, like if you operated on a, if you did a procedure on a COVID patient and something else happened to the patient and also the people around that person may have problems, then that will be an issue. The question remains if they cover or not. So, Ganesh, please send me an email. I will find out exactly what their position is and then I will let you know. The next question is, my practice is in uh, Chesapeake, I think that is how it is said, Virginia. I continue to see patients but not doing any procedures, mainly new patient and follow-ups and Brace, my practice is braces, I believe. I continue to see patients but not doing any procedures. Do you have any advice? Is there any restriction scheduling patients? SS, I don't know what that means. Final, do you have any advice? Is there any restriction scheduling the patient for cash or something like that? This. Your usual restrictions follow the same restrictions here. If your state has a restriction that you should not do the procedures, then that is the same restriction. And if your insurance has, if you are a participating provider and that is a covered procedure, if I understand the question properly, you, you may not be able to do that. Even then you can give whatever the paperwork, and if they still pay cash, you may be able to do it. You need to check your state law. Okay. Any new questions? Uh, Terrence Gray, will private payers and work comp pay for video and telemedicine as CMS has agreed to? That is a question. Many of the private payers are paying, I believe, but the workers' comp, I don't know. I, that always reminds me about Kentucky Public Health Commissioner who says that don't get into all these details. Just go on with it. So you can just do it and then 
work with them. We are working at a federal level to get a presidential order for all of them to pay for telephone only until June 6th. Of course, Congress can only mandate CMS. Administration can mandate CMS. CMS means it is Medicare and Medicaid. So private insurers and work comp, we have to wait and see what happens. Anthem has put the notice that they will pay audio only. And there are Cigna and Aetna, I think they are going to cover according to president. That is what they told him. Other ones, I don't know yet. Okay, next question is, is there a specific website to get detailed information about the PPP loan? There are numerous uh, websites. We have also last posted a lot of these things on ACIP website. You can go there and get it too. But you should be getting a lot of information on it. And they are at ACIP website. If not, send me a letter. We will send you all the information. But as he said, you should file it as soon as you can because you may not have enough time. Next question is, what is your advice if one of your staff members has some symptoms? My advice would be, I'm a little bit too careful or whatever, but I just send them home and I keep them at least 14 days, or preferably 19 days, away from work. And I also give them a prescription of, uh, send them for testing, of course, but uh, we give hydroxychloroquine. Now we are adding azithromycin to it. Okay, next question is, Medical Mutual for Ohio Health is going to cover at usual rates as of two days ago. That is good information. This is from uh, Ohio physician that they are going to cover. Okay, so all the speakers, thank you. Do you have any comments, closing comments? We have five more minutes. Anyone? Yeah, I, I, I have one. I, I have uh -huh. one comment. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and that's um, regarding the paycheck payroll uh, protection loan about how to calculate payroll averages. And uh, this was a clarification that was provided to me by uh, Harold Cordner, our current president. And that is uh, payroll is average of 12 months of 2019, or you can use January to February of 2019. But if you're not in business in 2019, you can actually use the first two months of 2020 uh, to, to, um, to tabulate payroll. Uh, so just in case someone needed clarification on that. So, Maria, you want to give some words of wisdom since they haven't asked any questions. So you need to tell us how we are going to so, go, especially for me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Manchikanti. So, um, I mean, when we think about hierarchy of needs, clearly everyone is in survival mode. Everyone is trying to make sure their basic needs are met. Um, for many of you, you're trying to keep your practices and thrive while maintaining practices and that, that makes a lot of sense. And so my my parting words are going to be to protect time, make space. Um, I have to do this as well. I have to protect time from my mental health and my mental well being as a mother, as a spouse, um, as a practitioner, as an instructor. I have to be ready for my students, ready for my patients, clients, children, and I we have to make time and protect time, uh, schedule in time for self-care for ourselves. On the screen, I've put the, um, the slide up where we have our resources available to you, again, at https colon backslash backslash selfcaretips.tulane.edu. 
and some of these are real-time tools, like three-minute tools you can use. You can close the door to your office. You can give yourself that space and that time to reduce stress and to recalibrate and to help your thermometer uh, be manageable so that you are not overly stressed and causing yourself to have symptoms that could impair your functioning as a physician. So again, just thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much for um, allowing me in your space. And Behavioral Health is here for all of you. We are here. We can provide services through telehealth. And um, we thank you for being able to do interdisciplinary work. And um, just thank you for your service. Thank you, Maria. Uh, any other questions? Uh, uh, anyone else wants to make a comment? Amit, do you want to make a comment? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, we should keep, all keep an open mind and be, uh, uh, as I said, mindful about what is happening. Uh, um, it, I know it's a very distressing time for everyone. There's so much happening on social media and so many different kinds of information are co coming at us from every different angle. And that's hard to sort out what is real, what is not. There's a lot of uh, uh, misunderstanding as well as misinformation. So it's uh, best to uh, follow some um, people who uh, tell you the evidence and tell you what's happening and then follow them to see what's happening and how things are panning out. Because every time we come up with something, there's a, always a negative. Uh, we find chloroquine, then people start dying of uh, uh, heart uh, problems. So uh, you have to be vigilant and careful and uh, uh, have faith in some people uh, who you trust and uh, follow their advice. Uh, I think that's all I can say. So what is the question about uh, chloroquine and heart problems? Does it have my yeah, heart this, yeah, what happens is with this, uh, uh, when you give as a throw with chloroquine, uh, they, it, it prolongs the QTC and uh, if someone has a prolonged QTC to begin with because of other medications, uh, I think uh, that makes you more prone to arrhythmia. So, uh, so there are guidelines on those, uh, in at least our hospital has come out already with that so that people don't uh, um, overdose on them. And in, in, I have friends who who was talking about starting uh, chloroquine prophylactically, like they're surgeons and they're like, oh, uh, we're gonna start prophylactic once a week Chloroquine, uh, thinking it's a good so idea, you think but once a week we'll do that. In India, I, no, I don't, I don't. I'm not. I'm not promoting it, and I'm not uh, saying that this is thing to be done. But I, I'm just saying that be cautious and get the information before uh, jumping in and say, okay, no, 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 this is what I have to do. Uh, I would not do that. Uh, I would use all my other uh, tools like precautions that we uh, have and be promoting uh, social distancing, keep our hands clean, keep our um, uh, mask on. I think those are the things which we need to do and uh, be careful of what we touch. And um, I think those are the most important things that we can do. And uh, I, I, in, the, in our hospital, especially in the North, we are using chloroquine and azithromycin for treatment. I mean, in our hospital itself, we have like 200 patients in the floor already. We are an 8,000 bed hospital. So 200 are already occupied by uh, around 40 people are on the ICO. So, um, um, so it's, a, it's still an epidemic in progress. I mean, so I'm sure they're going to occupy more beds as time goes by, and they are okay. using these medications on the floors. Is, uh, uh, for these so, what about hydroxychloroquine? Yeah, I mean, I think either of them are effective, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. No, no, I mean, you are toxicity-wise. Yeah, yeah, I, that was, I think I heard of uh, someone had an arrhythmia uh, using hydroxychloroquine. Uh, uh, well, uh, along with have arrhythmia medicine. when they were drinking Coke, water, simple water or a protein drink, but uh, I'm not sure. I don't know when you graduated from India, but I graduated in 1972 from medical school. As a part of medical school curriculum, we had to go to small towns and give everyone two tablets of uh, chloroquine. 
every child, adult, everyone. And then when I used to travel to India in early years, in 70s and early 80s, we had to take two tablets of chloroquine. Everybody did that, my family, my wife, and my children. So, well, I guess arguments keep going on, but they are trying that quite a bit in New York right now. I'm not recommending that we need to take for that, but if you have an EKG and you don't have any issues with that, you can go ahead and give a patient who is symptomatic. Essentially, we gave to all our employees here. They are not oh, taking did? it. They, they are just holding it. So Then there is one more clarification that workers' compensation in California is also paying for telephone visits. So I thought that was a good news. I wanted to bring that. Then I think uh, we have only one more minute, so I think we should say goodbye. Thank you, everyone, and we will have two webinars next week, one on Tuesday and one on Friday. We will have a CMS speaker. We will have uh, many other speakers along with uh, Kevin Foe. He will be speaking, too. So. It is extremely important for us to go through it successfully. And we also have, again, another lecture on uh, burnout. Burnout. That's also from uh, Pamela McPherson. She is from Louisiana, too. Thank you for attending, and good night. If you have any questions, please let us know. We will try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manchikanti, for having me. OK, thank you. All right, I believe that's all the time we have for today. On behalf of ASIP, I'd like to thank all of our attendees for your participation. We'd also like to thank our speakers for the excellent presentation. At this time, if you'd fill out the brief survey on your screen, we appreciate that, as we can use the feedback to improve future webinars. Your feedback is appreciated. This concludes today's webinar. We hope you have a great day.